All right. Let's go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word today. I pray you help us as we have uh, this discussion on Romans 5 and 6. I pray you help us ask good questions. I pray that you would open our minds to the scriptures. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Who, want us, who wants to guess how many days we have left, class days we have left uh, in this semester? 20, 25, I heard. Uh, today, I think, is 22 days left. So four days this week. We've got a work day tomorrow, a service day. Uh, four days next week with uh, Good Friday. A full week uh, after Easter. Um, then I think assessment day on that Tuesday and then the last week is a full week so it's 22 uh, total class days we have left not very long at all amazing how uh, how fast this uh, goes by uh, don't forget to uh, start working on your uh, memory verses uh, Yeah, don't, uh, don't forget to um, get started working on your memory verses. Uh, you don't want to put that off. Um, I have had a number of people ask, can I do it in two sections? And I used to do that, um, like if someone got in trouble. But what happened um, is people started wanting to say two verses at a time, like say two verses and then go out and study for 15 minutes and say two more verses and go out and I just had to say uh, no um, it's you'll be able to do it if you start now uh, it, it will get in your long-term memory so moral of that story is uh, start now you can use any uh, uh, translation that's uh, listed here or if you're a native speaker of another language, you're welcome to use that. Just bring whatever uh, version you intend to use so that I can follow along and check it off as uh, you say it. Um, the deadline for that is Friday, um, uh, April 28th. Uh, if I'm in my office, uh, just knock on the door. It takes about five minutes to say the verse, so just come by uh, any time. My office hours are listed on, uh, on the door. We're looking um, today and for several times as we continue in Romans with this idea of what it means to be forgiven by grace, to be accepted by God as righteous by faith. How does that work out in a Christian's life uh, practically? Does that mean that um, if I pray the prayer, can I just live however I want to? Um, Paul's going to address that. I love this um, uh, artwork from the Full of Eyes website of um, we're being raised up to a new life just as Jesus was raised we're being raised up to a new life so that's part of what we're going to talk about today uh, the center of the book of Romans Jesus as the new Adam uh, just as Adam was the federal head of the human race and whatever his choice was was the choice of all his natural offspring if you want to think of that by an analogy the same way david fought goliath and if david wins then the whole army uh, wins so too uh, jesus as the new adam is facing uh, more than the uh, test the first adam faced and his obedience is being imputed to all those who would ever come to him by faith that's uh, what Paul uh, is going to be arguing 
here in this section in Romans. So we're looking at uh, chapters 5 and 6. Uh, did anyone find anything interesting in the homework as you work through that passage uh, for today, starting with being justified by faith and then the beginning of 6? Well, what does that mean? Should we sin that grace may abound? Did anyone find anything interesting about that uh, passage as you work through it? Yes, Elena. So the version I said, um, it said that there was one individual that sin entered the world from, and I was wondering if it was counting for who that was counting Adam. It's counting uh, uh, Adam. Uh, Adam is the one who broke the original command, and then uh, all that, uh, all his natural offspring, that his act was imputed to them, and Elena, do you, I imagine you may have a follow-up question uh, with that, or uh, m- maybe not. Uh, uh, most people, when they find that passage a little confusing, the uh, question often arises, well, you know, how is that fair? One, one person kind of plays for the side. Uh, how... Uh, you know, nobody asked me uh, that he could bat for this side. Why? Why should that be? Um, and we're, and we're going to talk a little, little bit about that, Carlos. Uh, why did God decide to like punish all humanity of one man's sin? Like, he could easily just leave God. Like, yeah. So the the question is, well, how's that fair? Because in the Old Testament, God says, don't put a son to death for the father's sin in the same way don't put a father to death for the son's sin. Each person will die for their own sin. Uh, and God um, God is fair and God completely understands that. I wonder if the elegance behind it isn't on the other side. Um, so if one guy's going to play for the side and Adam struck out and his strikeout counts as all of our strikeout, I don't much like that. You know, I, I want to bat for myself kind of thing. Until you realize the parallel with Jesus, would it be a good thing if Jesus batted for this side and if Jesus success became the success of all those who would ever be connected with him by faith would would that be a desirable outcome and you start thinking about it it's like yeah that that would be pretty good like he lives the perfect life and then we get that perfect life and a lot of people in Christianity stop there with it. So the kind of the end goal is to get a person to walk down the aisle and kind of assent to that. Uh, for many decades, uh, that kind of was viewed as, um, you know, the sum total of Christianity. Um, but Paul doesn't stop his argument there. And uh, the whole idea of the new covenant is God giving someone a new heart, and the result of that new heart is actually walking in the ways of God. And so what Jesus has done, he played for the side, if you will, batted for the side, if you want to say it that way, but he also signed his name that the day would come when everyone would be completely conformed to his character and will. And once you start understanding it that way, uh, all the natural offspring of Adam end up being totally corrupt and all the supernatural offspring of Jesus end up being totally transformed so there's a parallel that the elegance of it comes when you understand the parallel I think that's a great question other uh, questions or 
Marissa. And, or are we just like missing something? And, and Paul has just said none are righteous uh, uh, in three. So how, how can he say for a good man someone might even dare to die? Well, it's interesting that the Bible does call people righteous. Noah is called righteous. Uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, uh, John the parent, uh, Baptist's parents are called righteous. Um, um, even the recipients of the book of Romans are called um, um, faithful. Um, and so how do you balance that? And I think we're going to see today that there's a, a distinction between what you are at the core of who you are and kind of the leftovers. Um, and so that God can call us righteous even though um, we're a mixture of righteousness and unrighteousness. But that, uh, Marissa, that's exactly the kind of question I think that Paul uh, presupposed that we would have when we uh, read through that text. So that, that's a great observation, great question. Uh, anything else? Uh, observations as uh, we... Uh, yes, oh, uh, Rob? Yes. yes. I know the Bible has had multiple passages about kind of giving guidelines to slaves and talking about how a master should pay their slave or respect their slave and mm-hmm. those conditions are there. Whereas I think our modern understanding pretty much equates slavery with abuse and with, oh, with abuse. And Paul even says like this metaphor only reflects our human understanding and he doesn't completely I, show it. Right, I'm speaking in a human way I'm speaking by analogy Um, there are um, three different words in Greek um, to express the idea of slavery and uh, um, oikonomos where we actually get the word economics from is someone who has the law of the household and that would be, I think, what we would call a steward. Um, you could be incredibly rich and be a steward. Um, I suppose that's kind of like being an employee uh, today. Uh, there's a household uh, servant, an oikates, and you can, oikonomos and oikates both have the word oikos, which means house. And so there's kind of, uh, you know, service in a house. The lowest word is the word doulos. And um, that was what everyone in antiquity wanted to avoid. No one wanted to be a doulos. Um, And um, the odd thing is that at the beginning of Romans, when... um, Paul describes himself, he says of himself, uh, if you want to know who I am, I'm the doulos of Jesus. And so that's a really odd choice of a word, but he's saying if you want to know what's most important about me, know this, that I acknowledge Jesus as the person who um, is has complete ownership of who I am, and you say, Paul, that like that's not a good choice of the word, but I think Paul would say that's true because most people who are masters are terrible people, 
Um, but Jesus gave his life to redeem me, and so I want him to run my life. I, you know, I want him to come and take over because he is so good. And um, so when Paul uses that term, Lord Jesus Christ, he's acknowledging a relationship of this is someone who tells me what to do, and I'm, I'm actually glad of that because he's so for me uh, and for me flourishing in life. And, and you think through that and you think, wow, that is really different from the, the way, um, you know, most people would think about that. So it's, it's interesting, but that's a great observation. Anyone else? Uh, Elena. Where there is no law, sin is not counted, is not reckoned. So what's that about also, I'm pretty sure that Paul said somewhere else, maybe not in Romans, um, something about how like unreached people don't have like the excuse that a lot of people think they have to not know God because they can like look around them, but how are they held to the law if they've never been told it? Yeah, so um, that is... That is such a fantastic question. Um, Paul's argument in five is the overarching argument is God is fair. It isn't like God is this unreasonable. God is fair. But Paul points out, okay, um, when did people get the Ten Commandments? Like, and this is just a general question. When did, like, you just go to the Old Testament text and just add up the chronology. You, if you want to count Adam at uh, year zero, when did people get the Ten Commandments? From year zero, like, just rough estimate, would you say? If you want to call Adam year zero, like 4,000 something B.C., the law was given in 1446 B.C. So that's like 2,500 years. Did God still, um, did people die between year zero and 1446. But they weren't breaking the law because the law hadn't been given. Have you ever thought about that? Um, I think what Paul's going to say is they were judged not because they were breaking a command they got from God, they were judged because they were living out of conformity with God. And so God not counting their active breaking as what condemns it because the next sentence says death reigned. Death reigned in all those years before the law came and he's saying it rained because God is justly saying, well, let me put it this way. Um, would er everyone grant that the Bible says that things reproduce after their kind in creation? Like when God creates something, let it reproduce after its kind? And would everyone grant that the Bible says on the day you eat it, you will surely die of Adam and Eve? Would you grant that that means they're spiritually dead? So here's the question. What kind of offspring will two spiritually dead people produce? And 
what kind of acts these spiritually dead and remember the text is going to say and Paul's going to say you and I were spiritually dead um, and so this argument and Elena is, I think you're perceiving how important this is to the whole thing how is it that people are dying when they're not actually breaking a written down law that God had given them and we're going to see Paul's argument is pretty a pretty powerful argument uh, Henry Yeah, that we're all violating a law that we've been given. And a lot of people will say, what about people who have never heard? And that's true. And that's, we should be so missionary minded uh, because people have been missionary minded to us. But we also should ask this question, I think, do we all... Uh, descend from the same first two parents. Would you agree that the Bible s say that we uh, all descend from the same two? So we're all related ultimately. Uh, would you also grant that we all descend from one of three of Adam's sons? That if we take what the Bible says that all of us are related again in the offspring of Noah, would you grant that? Which means, how do people get to the place where they don't know who God is? Is it not true that somewhere in their past there was an ancestor who knew the truth and decided to turn away? And are there not people today who have been raised uh, in churches who are turning their backs on Christ? And doesn't the, the argument, oh, well, this child, or not child, but this person, you know, has never heard. That's true. They have never heard. Are they a part like we all are a part of a guilty human race? who repeatedly, over and over, we all have turned our back on God. Paul, Paul's helping us see that, that we're all in the same boat. Uh, no one can say, hey, I'm following God because, hey, my family's good. Uh, Paul won't let us uh, um, argue that. I should know your name, and I've forgotten it. Will you Kelsey. tell me? Kelsey. Kelsey. Yeah. So I just feel like that could be a little bit difficult to understand if you grew up in a household, you know, where children it, do it is. It's massively difficult uh, to understand. Um, and I, I wonder if part of what God is doing in his word isn't helping us kind of think through those difficult areas. Um and we're going to see, uh, Paul's going to take us through some difficult arguments. But when we step back and look at the whole of the argument, uh, there's a lot of reason there. So, Is it Bria? Good. And then also, 
also I think too that God knows who would turn away from him and who wouldn't given the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so isn't it like Muslims see the man in white or something like that? Uh, I'm I'm beyond my depth there. I I don't uh, okay. I don't know. But it's like there's something about how Muslims have been seeing a vision of Jesus or something like that, even though they haven't been I suppose in that culture. But then it's like God reveals Himself to those who who knows, I believe, like are chosen and who will. Yeah, the Bible's clear. Anybody who takes a step toward God, God's going to take more than a step toward them. Um, God uh, is going to end up with trillions of people saved in heaven. Um, and so God's not miserly in how he's giving people grace. God uh, God is abundant uh, in grace, um, and we're going to see that. Well, good. You, you guys are um, wrestling with exactly the kinds of things I would think uh, readers of these passages would wrestle with. So what we're going to talk about today um, is that Christians are connected to Jesus the same way we were once connected to Adam. Um, this idea is going to be very important. Uh, in Adam, uh, we inherited a pollution of nature that, if just left alone, inevitably always leads to certain outcomes. You and I were in Adam. Everyone was in Adam. And Paul is making the argument is the same way we were once connected to Adam, now we're connected to the new Adam. Jesus. The same way Adam passed on a sin nature, Jesus grants us a new heart, and it's his heart. So uh, at the core of who we are in Adam, there's a fallenness. Uh, even uh, Christians, because uh, children are, are produced in the natural way, uh, those children, you know, David can say, in sin did my mother uh, conceive me from the moment that I was a little one. Uh, coming out of that fallenness, I was a fallen person from the second I was uh, conceived. Uh, one day even our bodies will re be redeemed in heaven so that the already not yet will just be one day uh, totally true of the entire entirety of who we are. That's not quite what's true of us now. We have the new heart, but we have remnants of the old flesh. So just as Adam passed on that sin nature, Jesus is passing on to us his perfect heart, a heart that loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and a heart that loves every single one of his neighbors exactly as he loves himself. Jesus is, is praying for the people who are abusing him as he died on the cross. He loved his neighbors himself. Every single person who uh, is his neighbor, he loved. Adam failed in this uh, office that he was given uh, to bat for the side. Jesus triumphed in everything. So Jesus faced the same temptations that Adam faced and more, but the difference is Jesus never failed. There's no temptation that ever faces any of us that Jesus hasn't faced that similar temptation and succeeded. The goal is God wants to bring us to a place where we obey him, not because we're trying to get something from God. He wants to bring us to the place where we just love God so much we want to make God happy. We're not doing it to try to get something. We're doing it out of a love for God. That's what we're going to talk about today. So, Justification in the new Adam. So this is what Paul's arguing. 
one guy fights for the side. If he wins, we all win. One guy loses for the side. If he loses, we all lose. Adam lost. Um, Adam batted for all of us and he struck out. And when he struck out, God counted that as all of us striking out. And just, you know, with an asterisk there, a footnote, somebody say, well, I don't really like that. Well, Paul would say, and Paul does say, okay, how have you been batting lately when you face the temptation? Uh, have you been, like, just knocking home runs out of the park, or have you been failing? Have you been faced with the same temptation Adam faced and chosen to disobey God? And so one guy fighting for this side seems... Uh, a little unfair at first till you step back and kind of look at reality and say, hey, in reality, I'm facing the temptation that Adam faced every single day and over and over again, I'm choosing to rebel against God. Justification in the new Adam. The argument's going to be Jesus is the new Adam. So here's the text. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, uh, became a living being. So physically, all our bodies go back to Adam and Eve. Adam is our natural forefather uh, for all of us. Adam became a living being. The last Adam, and so this is Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. So in other words, Paul is saying, when you read the Adam story, realize that there's a, a second version of that story where Jesus is the new Adam. And we've seen over and over in this class the connection. The first Adam was wounded in his side out of that. His essence was taken. That essence was house built into a woman. Uh, that man and woman were united in a marriage by God. They were given the deed to the Garden of Eden. They were going to live forever. Their one our goal was to fill that area up with little God lovers and to enjoy God uh, forever. And they failed at that. Uh, they wanted more uh, than that. And they believed a slander against God that somehow God didn't have their best interests in mind. Jesus came along as the new Adam. He was wounded in his side. Out of that wound, God took some of his perfected human essence. He's house building that into a new Eve, the church. And he's bringing that new Eve to the new Adam uh, and giving them the deed again to the Garden of Eden. The difference is that God has made that new, will make that new Eve untemptable by evil, um, where she just loves her husband so much that she couldn't think about sinning against God. That's the sweep of the story. But at the essence of that idea is this idea that Jesus is the last Adam. Um, Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the one who's going to bat for the side, but the difference is he won. And his winning is counted um, as the victory of all his supernatural offspring. Uh, so you can think of the dirt man who fails and the God man from heaven who never failed at anything. He who comes from above is above all. So that's Jesus. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. I love in uh, Greek it's says uh, a little bit more plainly, uh, thinks dirt things, right? The guy from dirt thinks dirt, right? The guy from heaven thinks heavenly things. The dirt guy failed. The dirt Adam failed. The heaven Adam never failed at anything. There's a connection between the two Adams. Adam was given the Garden of Eden. He failed. God said, I'm going to make a new covenant. The new covenant is going to produce a new power couple, a new Adam and Eve. 
that new Adam and Eve will love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. And that new couple is going to see to it that the whole universe is filled with little God lovers. The story is the same uh, from Eden to the new Eden. Uh, the covenant is different. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. This is a different passage, but saying the same truth. Uh, the second man is from heaven, as was the man of dust. So are those who are of the dust. So Adam fights for the side and fails. And those who are connected uh, where their only connection is with Adam, inevitably, there's a failure that's going to happen. Um, uh, people over and over will say, I don't need God to be good. And God says, okay, let's see how that plays out. I don't need God to be good. Let's see how that plays out. And over and over and over, uh, that experiment is, is run. And what happens is people fail. There is a, a, a natural connection between uh, Adam, the original Adam, and uh, his natural offspring. But then Paul said, and as is the man of heaven, so of those who are of heaven, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of heaven. The dirt man, Adam, failed. The God man, knew Adam, never failed at anything. And the Bible describes a way for us to become the children of God, to be connected to this second Adam. And if we're connected to the second Adam, eventually we're going to talk like him, act like him, think like him, love like him. Just as we all have borne the image of uh, the dirt man Adam, so all those who come to Christ in spiritual bankruptcy looking to him to save them, Every single person who does that is going to end up bearing the image of the new Adam. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have it right now through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope, in the hope that one day we are sharing the glory of God. And the glory of God is that he's completely righteous, completely good, completely holy. We have the hope that one day that's going to describe us as well. Do we have that now in this life? I won't speak for you, but I can speak for me. Uh, is, is it the tr truth for me that every single day I just wake up and think, I just, how can I love God more today? And how can I think more about other people? Uh, is, is that my reality or is it different from that? Can't speak for you. I'll speak for me. My reality is different from that. Uh, I wake up, I want to walk in God's way, but like there's other stuff going on too. Like uh, I've got a new heart, but I've got like leftovers from an old life. And what we're going to see in Romans 7 is Paul's going to say, I've got leftovers from an old life. But even though that's the case, Does he say here 
and we'll do a little English grammar. Does he say we will have peace? Or does he say we have peace? We have it. He's going to say in 8, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is in the future when you die and you see Jesus no condemnation or does it say there is therefore now no condemnation? But God, I can be selfish. But God, I can be oriented toward a love for sinful things. I can be selfish. I can be pompous. I can be arrogant. And God says, I know. And there is no condemnation. That's not how I'm choosing to look at you, that's not how you're going to exist for all eternity. There is right now no condemnation. But God, do you remember what I said? I remember what you said. There is now no condemnation. But God, do you know? God says, yeah, I know. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, no condemnation. Jesus, as the new Adam, is the true image of God. Jesus passes on his new heart to all those who will ever come to him by faith. He puts at the core of who they are something on the inside that makes them different people. Are they perfect people? No. Are they different people? Yes. You can think of what Adam did as this. He was intended to produce natural offspring that would be God lovers. And when he rebelled against God instead... He produced natural offspring who are spiritually dead. And they're spiritually dead from the moment they're conceived. And you and I, the scriptures say, were dead in our trespasses and sins. It's not like I can say, oh, look, I am so much more savable than this guy or that guy. I mean, I'm just like... His bones were scattered 12 feet and mine were only scattered 6 feet. So obviously I'm I'm more able for life. And it's like, no, this is who the entire lot of humanity, we were all dead. So 6.1 says this, well, okay, if Jesus bats for the side and his holy life counts for my holy life and Jesus gave everything uh, gave everything that he could possibly give well does that mean I can be selfish and stingy after all God's accepting me as righteous based on uh, him uh, uh, batting for the side so I guess I can just go uh, off and eat spiritual Cheetos until I weigh 1800 pounds because uh He's the player, I'm not the player, so I'm just going to eat Cheetos and he, and he can be the athlete. And Paul says, no. No. One guy bats for the side, but he's going to end up with a bunch of little God-loving athletes just like him. So should we sin? And the answer is... No, no way. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that we were baptized into his death? When Jesus died on the cross, he experienced the death that you and I should have experienced for our sin. He experienced the death that Adam and Eve should have experienced for their sin. He wore the thorny crown that they earned. He experienced the death that they introduced. He experienced being exiled from um, the, the grace of God, just as they should have been exiled from the grace of God. He died our death. Paul says, therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. In order that, all that happened in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Uh, when we as a generation, a multiple generation of uh, revivalists have this idea that the end goal of the Christian life is to get somebody to the front of a church to pray a prayer and then forget about that person, that's wrong. Uh, we, we were saved so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we could take the first faltering steps of obedience in the way of, ways of God. That's what God's plan was designed to do. In verse 5 he says, For if we were united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified. So there's something for the believer that has died already. I'm calling that the new heart. I think that's what Paul's talking about. Our heart of stone was taken away. We've been given a new heart. At the core of who we are, we're different people. But notice he said, our old self was crucified in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Well, that implies that in a Christian, there's something that still needs to be destroyed. There's uh, this body of sin that's still oriented toward the things of the world. I think of it like this. When you become a Christian, what happens is God gives you a new heart. I'm calling that the new heart of Ezekiel 36. I think that's how Paul thought of it. You're given a new heart, but what do you have still left in the way you think, in the way you feel, in the way you act, in the things you do? Well, you still have a fallen body of sin. And it still likes to sin, and it's oriented towards sin, and it can be talked into massive sin. You've got a new heart, but you still have the leftovers of this old way. And for a Christian, what's going to happen is you're going to have times where you grow and times that you fall. But what's going to happen over the course of the time is growth, and that's called sanctification. You're going to become more and more like Jesus. You're you're never perfectly like Jesus, but you're more and more like Jesus. Uh, people can see it. There's evidence in your life. And then when Jesus returns or at death, what's going to happen is what's true of your heart right now is going to become true of the entirety of everything about you. You won't be living in the already and not yet. You will be living in the total consummation. And Paul's saying, if that's true, then should we sin that grace may abound? May it never be. You are designed for this. This is where all of us are headed. And we're going to see over the next couple of days 
um, next couple of lectures that there's another side to this. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. So I hope you have a good rest of the day, and I will see you on Wednesday. Oh. The sign-in sheet never went around to us. Um, I forgot to send the sign-in sheet. Uh, if you would just check it on your way out, uh, thank you.